Hi, I'm Pablo. And I'm Aaron. And this is Get On My Corner, the show where we explore the corners of our world where history was made and the inventions that shaped our world first took root. And today we find ourselves at 333 Grant Avenue in San Francisco. And for you nerd herd members, the coordinates for today's little corner of the world are right here. In 1915, this spot was the site of the West Coast mic drop moment. The very first transcontinental phone call landed right here. That's right, from coast to coast, voice to voice, from New York to San Francisco, way before voicemails, smartphone, and your favorite Zoom filter. So today, we're telling the story of that first transcontinental phone call. What led up to it, why San Francisco was the destination, and how that one call changed the way we talk to friends and family ever since. So put your phone on, do not disturb. You get what I did there? That was a dad joke. I'm a dad now, I can say that. All right. And, just, and get on my corner for where the first transcontinental phone call happened. Almost every corner has a story. You walk past history every day without even knowing it. We are here to bring those corners to life. So go on and get on my corner. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I'd like to introduce you to professor, author, and all-around San Francisco Giants fan, Dr. Claude Fisher. Now, Dr. Fisher has written a book that clearly points to how that one call back, made back in 1915 has had a massive impact on our culture and our lives ever since. The title of the book is America Calling, A Social History of the Telephone to 1940. Welcome, Dr. Fisher. Thank you for having me. I'd love to start with some historical context, and specifically, why 1915? What political, technological advancements and developments made this possible to happen at that point in time? Well, the phone company had been working on trying to extend the line, the distances that you could call, and they had managed to go Boston to New York, New York to Chicago, but there were technical limits on what could be done, and that wasn't really breached until a call that was made cross country, actually the first one, in, in 1914. The political context is very important. This was a decade in which the federal government and a lot of state governments were uh, on the case of AT&T, demanding that they serve a wider public at lower rates. And so uh, the, the company, always very shrewd about its public relations, was quite happy to coincide the call with the Pan Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. And it made for a good package of uh, telephone marketing. Um, what were the major communication technologies before this transcontinental phone call? Well, if you wanted to go from coast to coast, you basically would have to send a telegram. Mm -hmm. That was the fastest. Uh, otherwise, you had to be uh, traveling. You had to go by rail. In the older days, you'd have to go around the horn. Uh, but it all it's important to realize, except for business, which dominated in the telegraph area, for most people, it was letter writing. And that was the way you kept in touch with anybody at any distance. I'm so curious about why San Francisco. Was there some symbolism? Like it doesn't go unnoticed that it's kind of East Coast to West Coast, you know, kind of bridging, you know, old America to this new frontier. Like what was the motivation for that? Well, it did coincide with the Pan Pacific Exposition. So there was a lot of uh, free publicity, you might say, and they uh, tacked on the uh, telephone call uh, to that event. But it's also important to realize that at that time, San Francisco was the metropolis on the West Coast. Los Angeles was just Cowtown. Some of us Giants fans still think it's a Cowtown. At Get On My Corner, we wanted to say we love all Cowtowns, baseball teams, cow towns with baseball teams and any baseball teams with cows we kindly ask you do not send us mail on this topic however naturally you are encouraged to hit that like and subscribe button thank you for your attention uh, but uh the financial center of the west was in san francisco the headquarters of the pacific telephone company was in san francisco in a very large tall beautiful building and so uh, San Francisco made the logical connection to New York. Yeah. Knowledge makes me so hungry. I cannot oh, wait. No, 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 no. What are you doing? Your hands are dirt. 
tea. You either use the Billy Clean or I hand feed you those nuts myself. Is, is that a real choice or should I just use the Billy Clean? Just use the Billy Clean. Okay, tell me how this works, Pablo. It's really simple. You pump it, just one pump. Okay, wow. You rub it, eight to 10 seconds. Okay. And now you've cleaned it. You don't need to do anything else. It is 100% natural, waterless, rinseless, body and hand soap from your pits to your bits. That's incredible and it's so simple. Is it lab tested? Lab tested to be just as effective as uh, soap and water, and it kills 99% of E. coli and staph while still keeping the healthy flora of your hands. That is so convenient. Thank you, Pablo, and thank you to Billy Clean for being this season's sponsor of Get On My Corner. Go to mybillyclean.com, enter the code Get On My Corner, and you'll get 50% off your entire order. And now, can I eat my nuts? Did you pump it, rub it, and clean it? I pumped it, rubbed it, now I cleaned it. Let's eat some nuts. Oh, that's delicious. Thank you, Pablo. Based off of like the geography and infrastructure, was, was it challenging to get that call over here? Like what, how did that play in the routing of the call? The, the company had been working hard on getting these lines extended as far as possible. Uh, the final connection working east and working west was at the, I believe, Utah and Nevada border. Mm. And that was done about a year before this call. So the technical apparatus was, was ready. Um, and it would fit in very much with a, with a theme that the phone company had. They had a phrase they just like to use, universal service. By then, that they meant all the phones connected under our command. Uh, not necessarily everybody has a phone. That was a whole separate topic. But the idea that uh, you could cross all sorts of boundaries if you were using AT&T phones, was very strong message. A lot of their advertising, the period, used this phrase, universal system. So you can see the tying of the sides of the country together um, would make a great uh, uh, capstone to this kind of argument. So we know that there was a phone call. Uh, we know that it broke barriers, but I'm so curious about what was actually said during this call, and was it scripted? How did that part of things go down? The key part of the call was the reenactment of the 1876 call between Bell and his assistant Watson, in which uh, Bell said, uh, Watson, please come here, or something to that effect. And so they set up Watson in San Francisco, and they set up Bell in New York, and they had the President of the United States in Washington, so I guess it was probably one of the first uh, you know, group chats. Um, and. Uh, Bell said something on the same order of Watson, I need you. Maybe that was the phrase. And Watson said something on the order of, sure, but it'd take a, five days, I think he said, for me to get there. Yeah. Uh, underlining again, both the history of the telephone, but also this dramatic idea that the phone was sort of tying the world together. Uh, so how did this really momentous domestic achievement impact the world impact global communications and culture and things of that nature? Well, the drama of this event uh, helped, I think, mobilize not only further expansion of the American system across north, south, and all directions, but also raised uh, the possibility that you could be doing this internationally. Now, there were international telegraph uh, systems but laying cable to do telephone systems so that you could have a call from London to New York was something that would come into the future. And uh, I think if you look at the commentary around this event and you look at um, the commentary about the telephone in that period, there were a lot of visionary ideals. This was going to be the way we would knit all peoples together. There was another sales point that the phone company marketed, that this was a way to bring peace to the world because now we could talk, everybody could talk to each other. And this uh, particular ceremonial event is the kind of thing that stirs those kinds of dreams. I want to go back to this day and just kind of jump off from the day in 1915. So they hang up. What happened next after that, after that hang up? Well, the years following this phone call saw the spread of the telephone, not only geographically, which is what this event symbolized, but in terms of the kinds of people who are getting telephones. 
For a long time, the phone company had resisted the idea that the telephone could be a uh, instrument that somebody could use for just social life. It really focused very much on saying this is for business, yeah. even the business of the household. But more and more, families got it for family life. Uh, women became major users of the telephone in the domestic sphere. It was some telephone industry people complained about it, but the fact that women were using it for social interaction, um, you saw increasing demand in rural areas for telephones, particularly by rural women who complained about isolation and loneliness and thought that the telephone would be one way of breaking through that. The automobile was another, but the telephone was the first way of possibly breaking through that isolation. So by the time you get into the 1920s, you start to see this as a, a device that's in middle class homes, not just in upper class homes or not just in the um, business offices. And then uh, the interesting thing I've told a story in my book is right in the late 1920s, the telephone company, the AT&T, decides to switch its philosophy. Instead of saying, let's stop having people use this phone for gossiping and chit-chat, we want them to use it for business. They start saying, hey, you know, we could sell more telephone service if we said, hey, use it for gossip. Use it to keep in touch with your relatives. And the marketing changed in the 1920s, and there was a lot of messaging about this is not just a device for practical purposes. It's a device for keeping families together. It's a device for getting together with your friends. And that's sort of a birth of phone life of the 20th century. What do you think we would be today if this hadn't happened when it did in 1915? The kind of broader social uses of the telephone would have been slower in coming than they had been. Compared to Europe, in Europe, a lot of the pricing and the system way it was run kept phone ownership relatively low for much of the 20th century until a good deal after World War II. So there was a period there where Americans, because I think of a lot of this competition, these rural phone companies, these independent phone companies putting pressure on AT&T, the phone spread into more sort of middle American lives. And it became a kind of part of regular life. I've written in my book that one of the interesting things about the telephone is how quickly it becomes mundane, uninteresting, part of the furniture. I'm curious about how you feel like this achievement stacks up against some of the other great steps forward in our history. I'm talking about, you know, the first flight or the moon landing and some of these other like huge moments in American and global technological history. Where does that transcontinental phone call sort of stand? Well, I would take the call as symbolic of the spread of the telephone and it's entry into everyday American life. In that sense, I think the moon landing is very dramatic, but it really hasn't changed daily American life. Um, the automobile, which I compare the history of the automobile to the telephone in that book, the automobile was certainly another major change. In some ways, because it changed the geography of our cities and our layout and the way people work, you could say it was a more profound change. Uh, changing the structure of our society. And of course, in the 21st century, we have you know, the computer uh, age is certainly very dramatic. But I think we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which this relatively common device, what became a common device, it was earlier on a source of great you know, excitement and you know, mystery and voices at a distance and oh, wow. But it became sort of every part of everyday life and then became a lubricant of social life. I think we should never underestimate that. One of the things that, like, I'm really concerned about is um, the fate of Casey Becker from the Scream franchise. What would have happened to her if this phone call hadn't have happened in 1915? Would she still be alive today? Depends whether she was related to the telephone people. I don't know. I don't know this person you're talking about. Oh, hmm. that's I'm really not good in pop culture. You know what? <laughs> I see you. That was amazing. And to think, it all started right here. You see, this wasn't just a tech flex in 1915. It was the start of the interconnected world that we all live in today. And a huge thanks to Dr. Fisher for breaking it down and bringing this spot of history to life. 
And thank you for hanging out with us on this very corner. You see, history isn't just in museums or textbooks. It may have started on a corner that you walk past every single day. So keep your curiosity dialed in, bang. And remember, if there's a little corner of your world that you want us to bring to the rest of the world, email us. All of our information is in the episode notes. So for me and Pablo, that's a wrap for this corner. And until next time, get, get on, on my, my corner. corner.